Dr. Cur Curtis Carlson is the President and Chief Executive Officer of SRI International. Prior to joining SRI, Dr. Carlson was the Executive Vice President of the Sarnoff Corporation, one of SRI's two wholly owned subsidiaries. Four years ago, he took over as the uh, CEO of the parent SRI in Menlo Park, California. Dr. Carlson is a Tau Beta Pi graduate from Worcester Polytechnic Institute in Physics and has a PhD from Rutgers University. He's published over 50 papers and has received 15 patents. He is a member of Tau Beta Pi, Sigma Chi, and is a senior member of IEEE. Dr. Carlson is a true visionary and entrepreneur, and please join me in welcoming him to Sections Congress. Well, thank you. It's a great privilege to be with you. This is a very important organization. And it's um, a treat for me to be able to talk to you about uh, one of my favorite topics, innovation in this exciting world that we're in. I call it the exponential economy, and I'll tell you why um, in, a, in a minute or two. I'm going to see if this works. Hmm. I'm going to talk to you about innovation today. Um, this is um, kind of an unusual um, chart, and there's some probably unusual words on it from what you expect. I'm going to talk first about our world, the exponential world, and then talk about some ingredients that are necessary, um, in our view, to systematically lead to client and market success. And I'd like, um, I'd hope that this talk will apply to everyone in this room, uh, no matter what's your job, whether it's a technical job or it's a non-technical job. Let me tell you a little bit about um, SRI, just so you'll know uh, where I'm coming from. We're a not-for-profit in the heart of Silicon Valley. We were set up 56 years ago before there was a Silicon Valley. Um, we have about 2,000 researchers in two sites, um, um, Sarnoff Corporation in Princeton and the main facility in, in Menlo Park. Um, we're the organization, we received the first internet transmission, we came up with domain names, uh, we came up with the first wireless transmission, we won 10 Emmys on Oscar for our work in broadcasting and movies, we spun off over 30 companies in the last few years, some of them are the leading companies in the space um, in the world today. Uh, we've done a lot of work for national defense. Um, the internet, as many of you know, is completely insecure and, and pretty much a wild west right now, we're working on that to make that safe. Uh, we develop drugs um, to save lives. Um, alternative fuel cell technologies, alternative uh, energy sources in general. And we work on uh, technology for education, <clears throat> helping uh, children learn. In California, <clears throat> um, even though California has many virtues, uh, the K-12 through program in California is the uh, third worst from the bottom in the United States. <clears throat> Only Louisiana and Mississippi have worse K through 12 programs than California. And it's a really important issue. Well, with that as a little background so you know where I'm, I'm coming from, um, I've, uh, I worked on the team that won an Emmy for HDTV, and I've helped start 15 companies, and I'm a, I'm a really hardcore techie, you know, so I, I feel very comfortable here. Uh, but I think we have a challenge, and um, it's summarized by what I'm about to tell you uh, with the exponential economy. Um, as this group knows, um, innovation is the primary source for growth and prosperity and quality of life. Um, about 80% of growth and prosperity comes from what um, we all do. So it really is the driving force in the world today, and doing it well is, of course, a really critical thing. Now, Silicon Valley has gotten, a, um, until recently, an excellent reputation as being a, a, a really productive place for innovation. And there are a bunch of ingredients that are necessary if you want to have a really productive region. Obviously, you need talent, you need research infrastructure, 
uh, international industry clusters, people who work not only in the region but outside and around the world, which is one of the themes of this conference. Needs a, appropriate support infrastructure, weather helps, location helps, um, and an innovation infrastructure, the venture community and technical and legal services, and of course, appropriate government policy. The government can, no matter what we do in terms of our jobs, the government, of course, can either make it possible or make it impossible at the stroke of a pen. And as you know, the entire world is trying to emulate um, elements of Silicon Valley, whether you go to Singapore or Taiwan or parts of India um, or Spain, anywhere around the world and around the United States, everyone is trying to develop innovation clusters so that they can participate in this new world and be economically and socially successful. Now, among all the things that are um, part of this picture, the part I want to talk about is the innovation process, because I think it needs, we need to work together to dramatically improve how it's done. Now, we all know that our world is a dangerous place, and that makes our jobs both more important and more difficult. This curve shows what happens to Fortune 500 uh, companies, or S&P 500 companies. The S&P Standard & Poor 500 is, by definition, the largest 500 companies in the United States. It's just size. And when the S&P was formed in the late uh, 20s, uh, the average lifetime of a company was somewhere between 60 and 100 years. That's when we had this quaint notion of lifetime employment. Because it was lifetime employment. You could stay with a big company for your entire lifetime. Today, we're down to about 12 years for the average lifetime of a big company. It looks, and the curve continues to go down, it looks like if you belong to a big company, um, in some sense, you, you, you're part of a, an organization that's increasingly becoming a dinosaur. It can't adapt fast enough to the world that we're in. And you see that all over. Lucent, a really um, great company with great people, great technology, great market potential, goes from 150,000 people down to what, about 35,000 people at this point? How can that happen? Excuse me? And 50 cents a share, right. And they're not the only ones. Lots of tech companies are going through this. Now, one thing this group is very familiar with is Moore's Law. This is my version of it. Um, I've collected the name of every computer I could find, so um, you don't have to read all those little squiggly marks, but Basically, Moore's Law started in the 1900s with mechanical devices and then moved up to relays, vacuum tubes, transistors, um, microprocessor chips, um, et cetera, et cetera, all the way up, and now we're talking about uh, next generation technologies. What's interesting about this is um, over an extended period of time, what one company has managed to survive on this curve? There's only one. It's IBM, right? All the companies that I grew up with, you know, Burroughs, Honeywell, RCA, um, they're all gone. Pray, they're all gone. It's hard to stay on a curve like this where you have to double your performance um, every 18 to 24 months. All you need to do is make a few mistakes and you go away. Business mistakes, technical mistakes, and you go away. It's an interesting curve in another way because um, on the right-hand side it says, um, it predicts when we'll have a human equivalent computer, that is a computer that will go as fast as the human brain. Well, we have supercomputers like that today, but this curve says that by about um, 2015 or so, if we can keep Moore's Law going, we'll have a computer on our desktop that has the raw computing power of the human brain. It won't be as smart, of course, because it won't have the right architecture, but that's kind of like the four minute mile of computing. We're beginning to get there where we can actually do to embed real intelligence in even a laptop. Computer. Anyway, the main point of this curve is it's hard to stay on this. Now, as you folks know, it's not just computers, it's memory, fiber optics, the human genome, uh, the web. There are a lot of things that um, now improve at these rapid exponential rates. And they're beginning to affect things that really matter to us. Content on the web, for example, doubles um, even less than every 12 months. Uh, food is being genetically engineered. Uh, the infrastructure now is for entertainment, it's now all digital, so it's on this curve. Um, when it was analog, it, it couldn't move that fast, it kind of stuck. Now we're off that. And of course, medicine, probably the most important development 
um, and in technology ever when you move from us being physics um, and chemistry based to being information based. These are all profound effects and um, that's the world we're in. So I think of all these activities, this transition as being uh, the defining characteristic of when you go from stuff, when you build real things like cars, to what we do, which is to process information and create knowledge, we tend to get on these rapid growing um, exponential curves. Let's see, I think I skipped over one. Okay. So let me tell you a little um, story here. Um, you know, in the 1950s or so, Japanese products were considered to be um, almost an embarrassment. Made in Japan was a, was a derogatory statement. And um, the Japanese um, embraced um, continuous improvement with Deming and others. And they came up with the idea of total quality management, quality circles, and a whole hierarchy of a whole um, set of different ideas. And um, as you know, by the, ninth, the middle of the 1980s, the Japanese had almost taken over uh, many areas of manufacturing around the world. Um, Detroit was um, in retreat, um, and it wasn't until they were facing basic defeat and annihilation that they began to embrace these ideas aggressively and, and increase their quality and performance as well. Those ideas have uh, run out of steam. It's not that they don't apply when you make um, material stuff, they still apply just as well as they did. It's just that there are other parts of the economy that I just mentioned that go at much faster rates that where the Deming model uh, doesn't uh, quite do the job. Um, there is a person um, who I got to know, Doug Engelbart, who I want to tell you about, who I think did create a paradigm for knowledge workers for us that I find more interesting and, and valuable. Uh, Doug is the person who invented uh, the mouse, windows, hypertext, electronic spreadsheets, two way electronic tablet conferencing, and a bunch of other things that we take for granted. Um, many of you don't know Doug um, for a reason I'll mention. Uh, he just won the National Medal of Technology a few years ago, the highest award you can win. And what was interesting to me about Doug's story is that um, when he gave his demonstration in 1968, it was at um, the computer science conference in San Francisco. Uh, there was um, 1,500 people, I guess, there, something like that. And that's at a time when people were using punch cards to interact with computers. Well, those of us who are old enough to use punch cards know it wasn't a particularly friendly way to work with a computer. And Doug presented this profoundly different, much more human, interactive, real-time way. And um, the people in the room were absolutely um, transfixed uh, Doug not only talked about these ideas, he actually demonstrated all of them working in real time. And um, we all know how hard that is to do that. And um, at the end of his talk, Doug received a standing ovation. Now, I, I've gone to lots of technical talks, and we're, techies don't get out of their chairs, right? <laughs> and the reason is, he got the standing ovation is because they realized that they'd seen a revolution. They'd seen it um, in real time at that conference. And the people who were there, maybe some of you were, they call it the mother of all um, demonstrations. It, probably the most dramatic um, demonstration of computer science ever. Well, when I learned about this, I, I wanted to meet Doug. I mean, Doug continues to work with us, but I also wanted to know how he did it. Because you don't, you don't create a demonstration like that with a little team by accident. You've got to be doing lots of things right. Now, Doug did lots of things right, but SRI at the time did a lot of things that were wrong. So we licensed this technology to Xerox and to Steve Jobs. And most of the people in the world haven't heard of Doug, and they've heard of those two companies. And the lesson here is you have to, of course, if you want to get the full impact, you have to take it to the marketplace as well. <laughs> Anyway, I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about Doug's ideas in a second. The other big development that's happening, of course, is the internet. Um, even though we went through the bubble and that was crazy, um, certainly in Silicon Valley, um, we all know that it, it's just beginning. It still only touches a fraction of the population. It's still low bandwidth. It's not robust. It's not secure. It's got, you know, we've got, we've just got a whole world of things that need to be done to have, a, have the kind of impact that it can have. 
Uh, the other thing about the um, internet um, is that it allows for exponential interconnection. This little picture shows that. If, if you're one node on the internet, uh, you can only uh, communicate with yourself, and so the communications value is zero. If you can convince your buddy to um, sign up, then you can send messages back in two, and so that has a value of two, roughly. Um, if there are three of you, you now have several ways to communicate. You can communicate with each other, one, two, three, four, five, six, but you can also communicate in pairs, seven, eight, nine. When you get to four, um, you get the idea, I won't go through that, but the number of possible interconnections is actually going up exponentially. And there's never been a communications device like that before. And that's why, um, of course, many of you know this, but that's why uh, the internet, when people tap into this particular factor, can be uniquely powerful. I mean, I think we're just still beginning to understand how to take advantage of this incredible potential. So if we summarize this argument um, in very crude terms, the general economy has been cranking along for the last 100 years, let's say, improving at 3 to 5% per year. Um, down below, uh, there were things like Moore's Law. Um, and for a long time, people argued about whether there'd be much impact on the general economy. Even 10 years ago, people were still writing papers about uh, the impotence of computer technology and having an impact on the general economy. And about 10 years ago, the internet came along um, and um, they kind of came together and we had the bubble. But they keep on going and they keep on developing and it's just the beginning. And so the paradigms for innovation that were effective here, I would argue, are not so effective here. And the evidence is the number of companies that go away so quickly. Even in Silicon Valley, um, where people in Silicon Valley think that um, they're pretty good at forming companies, only about one out of 10 or 20 companies is around five years later. It's really pretty poor performance. Literally billions of dollars of wasted uh, work, um, not well done. So it leads me to this talk, <clears throat> this uh, picture that I want to tell you about some of the things, some of these ideas come from Doug, and some of them come from our own experience. <clears throat> I'm not going to tell you anything you don't know. Um, you folks have been, um, had illustrious careers, you've done lots of great things. But the question I'll, I'll ask you as I go through this now is, do your organizations do these things? In my experience, organizations do not do these things. Even though they know they're the right things to do. Even though they're almost cliches. Gary Hamill, I was reading a, a paper by him, <clears throat> very famous um, management consultant, and he said, if you ask CEOs, do they have an innovation process in their company? They all say yes. But if you ask the people in the company what the innovation process is, you get blank looks. There is no innovation process. And that's my experience working with companies all over the world. You walk in and you ask the people who are doing the work, what is your equivalent of Deming's process for you to be successful? And all you get is a blank book. So that's what we're going to talk about. <clears throat> so I want to go through these ingredients. We just talked about the exponential economy. And to me, that's an imperative to transform what we do. If you don't do that better, basically you can be sure your job will go away. That's what I tell our folks. Now the first question is working on important problems. This is one point of major confusion inside of organizations. People get confused about doing interesting things and doing important things. How many organizations know the difference between interesting and important? How many have that part of the lexicon? So are they really important? Or are they just interesting? And do you have a process to define your most important opportunities for today's clients, for future clients? And do you have an ongoing process to identify them? I find almost no company does. When I ask whether they're doing interesting or important work, again, 
I get blank looks, confusing looks. So why, why work on important problems? Well, we, we have been blessed to be put down in probably the most exciting technological time in the history of the world. There are opportunities everywhere. From biotech to infotech to nanotech, the convergence of these technologies, you almost, you know, if you just you almost stumble on opportunities in today's world. It didn't feel that way when I was starting out, but today that's true. All these exponentials collide with each other and they create opportunities. So I think there's almost an infinite number of interesting things, we, of important things that we can do. But you have to be able to identify them. And of course, if you're doing important things, they're also interesting. So why, why work on important things versus interesting ones? Well, you have to stay ahead of the exponential curve. How many times have you had run and talked with someone and they're working on a project and it's not up with the equivalent of your Moore's Law? So you know they're not going to get there. It's just wasted work. It's got to be above the line to make an impact. You have to have a process to think about that. Raise resources, attract the best people. You want to motivate your staff so they, they're thinking 24 by 7. I'll learn new skills and, of course, make creative and financial impact to be successful in today's world. Second piece is what we call champions. It's a quote I write by Margaret Mead. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed people can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. We celebrate champions at SRI, people with passion, people with commitment. If you don't have people who are committed on a project, what's the chance of success? Zero, right? How many times have you been in an organization where someone is running a project and if you ask them, are you committed to this? They go, I don't think so. What's the chance of success? When people come in to me, the first question I ask is, after we determine it's, whether it's an important problem, is are you a champion? You're gonna, are you passionate? Are you committed? Are you going to do what's necessary? Are you going to work with others? And if they say no, we say we're not going to do it. So we're kidding ourselves. We will not be successful. There are some other important words. Um, one is leader. Um, we're all techies. Um, I don't know about in your organizations, but if you ask someone to be the leader, it gets them a little bit confused. It's a great word. Um, I'm all for it. But um, an entrepreneur is a great word, but in Silicon Valley, entrepreneur means a risk taker. And um, as far as I can tell, the only thing that successful entrepreneurs have in common is they're risk mitigators, not risk takers. The good folks don't succeed one out of 20 times. They succeed most of the time because they do their homework. They treat it seriously. They take out risk. They don't take risk. So I can't use that word in Silicon Valley because it's got so much baggage with it, even though, again, it's a great word. And of course, well, the last is manager. Does, does anybody here want to be managed? We have technical people reporting to us, and I, I can't think of um, one situation I've been in where they want to be managed. So our way to get around this is to use champion. Do you have passion? Are you committed to what you're doing? And if you're not, we're not going to do it. Productive teams. Can you do it alone? Uh, the key word for us is productive. We don't send people down rafts. Um, we teach them teamwork. Um, companies that have to do that, I think um, you can predict right at that moment that they don't have a clue. Right? Why are they wasting their time when there's so many things to be done in this world that require productive teamwork? Not teamwork, productive teamwork. It's teamwork to get something important done. And one of the things, um, you folks know this, but there are people in this room who have a perspective on, I can just about probably anything I could think of, there's somebody in this room who has a point of view that's so unique and so powerful that you have, you literally have a genius IQ that comes from that experience and that point of view. 
And if you can tap into that, and that's what really good productive teamwork is, is tapping into the places in people, ordinary people, or really good people, but where their transforming point of view can create genius to your project. When we get out of the university, um, of course, we haven't been trained to work productively together. There are only a few colleges in the United States. One, my, my old alma mater, Worcester Polytech, is one of them that actually teaches teamwork. Most of us, when we got our PhD, if we collaborated with somebody else, it was called cheating. So when new employees come in, we actually have to beat that out of them. You know, it's a terrible thing. They've been, they've been given this really bad idea that you can do anything significant, especially, you know, as a double E, is really a, it's a, it's a false idea. So some people say one plus one equals three. We say one plus one equals N. Um, a small team, the Margaret Mead quote, um, can transform the world. You can come up today, a small team could invent a pathogen detector so that when everyone walks into the doctor's office, you could tell immediately whether they have the flu or they've been infected with anthrax. A small team can do that. And it could save millions of lives in America. It doesn't take a huge team. And the other point, apropos of the global aspect of this conference, is that no matter how smart your people are, most of the smartest people in the world are outside of your company. That's a Bill Joy quote. And do you tap into those folks? Do you have a mechanism to tap into the genius of other people like you're doing at this conference? Value proposition development. This is probably the most um, unique part of what I'm going to talk to you about. The first question I ask groups when I go into organizations is, who are your clients? And you get funny answers to that question. Immediate boss, board of directors, Shareholders, public, clients of services, of services, future client market opportunities, others. There's generally enormous confusion about who's the client. There isn't, there isn't this really consistent thought process that in an organization, everything we do is to create value for our eventual clients. That's a very rare company that you walk into where people can actually answer this question without confusion and stumbling um, about who they're working for. It also brings up the question is, what is client value? How many organizations have a culture where they talk about client value? And is value creation everyone's job? In the, in the company, what other job is there? It's not focused on the end client. How is it defined? And who defines it? We have quantitative metrics for defining client value. One that we use, we have a little spreadsheet we use. Um, it's a sum of quality plus convenience divided by cost. It's a very simple little thing, but we use it for everything. And um, it has a format I'll talk about in a second. But it's a way to develop a common language within the organization, the HR department from to the, to the folks inventing um, new internet technology. But if you don't have a language for it, how can you do the right things? What's a value proposition? Well, people know what value is in a in kind of a dictionary sense. Relative worth, utility, importance, fair return. And a proposition is an expression of that. But the different definition we use, which summarizes all this, is a statement of an important client problem, so something important that we need, that proposes the way, approach, we will use resources, dollars or people or whatever, to deliver superior client features per unit cost benefits compared to others in their markets, competition. Need, approach, benefits, competition. Now, curiously enough, we do this very intuitively in our private lives. Um, so um, you're going to be hungry um, pretty soon. That's the need. Uh, the approach might be to go next door to have lunch. Um, the benefits compared to McDonald's or some other restaurant 
um, is that it's closed, quiet, you'll be able to meet your friends and continue the discussion. We do this very intuitively in our private lives, but technical folks seem to have a really hard time doing this in their professional lives. So we've turned this into a bit of a uh, mantra uh, with an SRI. Um, we call them NABCs. What's the important customer market need? A compelling approach to solving that. What are the benefits and what's the worldwide competition? Because everything we do, everybody in this room, I assume, everything we do, we have to be able to demonstrate that it's the best in the world or else we don't win. So NABC captures the essential defining ingredients of the value proposition. So it's the beginning of developing a language, a culture around value in an organization. Now here's what a typical NABC from a technical person, let's say myself, Kurt, looks like. What's the need? The need is for a 30 gigahertz amplifier. The approach is to build a 30 gigahertz amplifier. The benefits is you will have a 30 gigahertz amplifier. <laughs> And of course, there's never any competition, right? Because if somebody else built one that's 29.999 gigahertz, so clearly ours is better. If your organization is like mine, that's what they always look like when they start. They start out with the approach, not the need. It's backwards, right? It's always completely backwards. And what's the process to eventually, even if it starts out this way, to answer those other three important questions. Now, another issue is um, we talked about the power of teams. Um, and so here's a schematic of an organization with people spread all over the place and a bunch of projects that um, tap into people. But can people in your organization walk around and talk to people and gather ideas? In some organizations, it's really hard to walk across to the next building and talk to a senior VP. It's really hard. Even though that person might be able to answer the question in two minutes. And if you can't do that, there's a lot of genius in your organization that you're not taking advantage of. So how do we take these ideas and begin to instantiate them? Uh, we have a whole process uh, that we put together but obviously we, we start by focusing on important client needs. We have a whole methodology for that. You have to write down the value proposition. If you don't write it down, it's not real. And the elevator pitch, iterate often, regularly, in a group. And our principle is if it's not written down, it's not real. You can't synthesize ideas unless you write down your ideas. So we have, we call them water and hold, but we have a whole series of institutionalized mechanisms where people come together and they incubate their ideas um, in a group uh, continuously. It just never stops. And the idea is to develop a culture of constant improvement, openness, um, where people accept the fact that uh, we never get it right the first time or the second time or the tenth time or even the thirtieth time. You want to do something important, you have to be open to lots of improvement to make an impact in today's world. And in most organizations we find that's hard to do. Now, one of the things that we find very difficult, and I think the IEEE could play an impact in some of your educational programs, is that when people start out, it's hard to convince them um, how good these have to be if you want to succeed. Again, Silicon Valley, only one out of 20 succeeds after five years. They haven't done their homework. They haven't learned these concepts that I'm just sketching out for you today. They don't know how to implement them and they fail. Because most people don't realize, you know, it's like they can jump over the bush in their backyard and they think they're in the Olympics. And then they get to the Olympics and all of a sudden someone's pole vaulting uh, 20 feet higher than they are. That's the world we're in. And very few people out of college um, understand how high the bar is or even um, how to think about it. And I think there's a great opportunity there. Um, the human imperatives. Everybody knows um, that it's hard to put together teams. The Mythical Man Month is a great book that talks about how difficult it is to add people to a team and make it be productive. I have a bunch, I'm not going to go through these, but I have a bunch of little rules that I use um, to, uh, that we um, share within our organization. Um, 
for example, I'll do, I'll do a couple of them. The DNA of change on the upper left. Um, people don't change unless there's a need or a desire to change. There's a new vision to go to. And there's an action plan to get there. They have to be all three, or else people don't move. And so often, you see change programs where the need hasn't been quantified sufficiently, or the vision has not been communicated in a compelling way, or there isn't an action plan. It's really simple stuff, but it's amazing when you have a little um, algorithm like that, how often you go and you see change programs in organizations, you go, what about this? I went, I went into a major corporation a while back, and they had rules for business on the wall. And I was looking at the rules. They were reasonable things. What's the investment? What's the risk? I asked the person, where's the need? There was no, nowhere on this list of fundamental principles in this company did they have customer need. It was all about approach and implementation. And the person I was talking to looked at me, and we looked back and forth at this this thing that was hanging on the wall, and he said, you're right. There's no need. How can they be successful? They're thinking, you know, they're pushing stuff out on people. There's no chance of success. Um, Gilbert Stock and Trade is, um, I'm um, being a, a techie at heart. I'm very tolerant of deviant behavior. You have to be in our business, right? But there's one thing I am not tolerant of. Probably the only thing I'm really not tolerant of. And it's um, cynicism. And every time you put a program together, um, you get a bunch of these things, misunderstandings, uh, distrust. But cynicism, um, I, I call cynics the mass murderers of innovation. Because they're always right. If you have a cynic on a team, they will destroy the team. Because they are really good at it. So, um, skeptics are good. Skeptics keep you honest. You need lots of skeptics, but cynics are really terrible. So I, these are my rules, and we can talk about them later if you're interested in them. But if we violate these rules we've discovered, um, we get in trouble, so we, we take them seriously. Uh, the last thing is organizational alignment. This you often see in organizations, too, where you, you ask about some policy, and is this consistent with getting the job done? And the person says no. And you go, well, does this make sense to you? I don't know. Well, why do you do it? Well, that's what we do. Well, in today's world, the market takes care of it. You go away. So it's important that your vision, strategy, goals, you have transparency, your reward structure, you have a common language, you have shared values. We have a little card. Um, it's a little pocket-sized ca card that We've um, created, it's about this size, that we give to all our employees, and I won't go through it, but it summarizes the kind of things that we, we talk about to make sure they're aligned. We give, um, we give a third of all of our royalty and equity from our spin-off companies to our employees, so that our employees are treated like employees in the spin-off companies, so they're aligned. Things like that. It's got to be, if you want to keep up in the exponential economy, and so often you see these things again and they're not aligned. So, um, we talked through these things. They're very simple ideas. But I'll ask you again. Um, you all have projects. Is it an important problem or is it an interesting one? Are you all champions, passionately committed to the success of the program? And do you have a productive team around you because nobody's smart enough? You have a value creation process to continuously improve and refine your ideas. Are you addressing the human part of the equation as part of a project? Not just as something that's an annoyance, but part of the project. It has to be addressed right from day one. And is your organization aligned to get the job done? And some of you may have noticed that um, this little equation Need champions, team, value creation process, human imperatives, and organizational alignment. There's a multiply sign there. I've worked on hundreds of projects. Um, my teams have won two Emmys. I, you know, I've done lots of really wonderful things. And what I've learned is that if one of those is missing, there's no success. I worked for RCA for many years. They, they gave me hundreds of millions of dollars to spend. And I, I failed on every project. 
as part of SEO. Great company, great technology, great business opportunities. Um, I spent millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars, and had no success for us here because we violated many of these rules all the time. But when we managed to achieve all these, we seemed to succeed almost 100% of the time. So, um, what you folks do, what we all do, um, you know, is really important work. It's the basis of everything good that's going to happen in the world. I think we're moving into a different kind of era where we have to work differently. Opportunities everywhere, um, obviously increased uh, competition, but um, additional opportunities to collaborate around the world too, to tap into the genius of partners and, and do a better job. And I think as um, organizations, as institutions, we need to start rethinking the innovation process so that we can keep up with it. And I've given you my little equation today. And I think it applies to companies, to governments. I spoke to the, um, the California management team a couple weeks ago, and to countries. We were in Taiwan um, a couple months ago, and Taiwan's going through a terrible transition, as many of you know, because they haven't, they haven't quite institutionalized innovation processes that allow them to keep up and be competitive with China and the rest of the world. So that's what I wanted to tell you today. Thank you very much. I, do we have time for a question or two? Or? Sure. Is a question? Yeah. yeah, go ahead. How would you compare the process you've talked about uh, with Six Sigma? Well, Six Sigma is um, an idea that comes from, from Deming's um, formulations of continuous improvement across the board, right, from all the different pieces. So Toyota is kind of the masters of this idea. So it's kind of built in in the sense of continuous improvement and driving. Um, I wouldn't say we've figured out um, how to quantify the metrics as well here as you would in a Six Sigma program, but we're trying to do that. We're trying to work that way. I'd say it's a piece. You mentioned passing concern about the depth of the problems in California's education system. Right. Do you have people in your organization that want to make a difference in that? Uh, absolutely. We have um, some of the most um, powerful um, technology innovation-based um, education programs. We're really committed about that. Um, it's actually the first time, as you know, education is dominated by political issues and other things yeah. that are yeah. kind of beyond... Um, uh, technical folks, but um, for the first time with handheld devices, with peer-to-peer -peer communication, um, and a whole host of other um, uh, technologies, you can begin to imagine a very different kind of educational environment. So it's the first time that I've seen in my career working in educational technology that those exponentials are beginning to um, get powerful enough to begin to um, confront some of those issues. That's what we're working on. I'd like to share some information with you. Thanks. Great. In the software development industry, the, there is a big move in terms of process quality improvement and things like that. Mm -hmm. There is also a school of thought that many of these initiatives go against the spirit of innovation. Do you have any comments? Yes. The, the question is, do these ideas work against the spirit of innovation? And um, that, was, um, that was a big issue in our company when we started. Everyone said, you're trying to hold back our creativity. And, and it's just the opposite, actually. And it's a funny thing that happens is that um, people um, discover after, usually it takes a couple of years in your organization before you start seeing successes, that people who would have had nominal successes all of a sudden begin to have profound successes. They begin to invent things and do things and partner with folks where they literally can change the world. I, um, so 
You know, that's my human imperative slide. You, you usually get that, but if you think about the principles I'm talking about, which is being open, continuous improvement, writing down your ears, tapping, tapping in ideas, tapping into the genius of other people, doing it aggressively and continuously, you know, with people who are passionate and committed, how can that be against innovation? That's, that's what innovation is. It's just taking it seriously and saying, gosh, if we're going to do this, let's go at it. Let's do it. If brainstorming is good, let's do it around the structure to answer certain fundamental questions, but let's do it with real commitment and get the answers to those questions soon as opposed to waiting, you know, and wasting resources and getting ourselves in trouble. So I agree it's, uh, it shows up, but um, we talk to our people now, they don't go back. Once they learn how to do this, they don't go back. Uh, I'm Eremita Miranda from the Metropolitan Los Angeles section. I would appreciate your comment on the California program that we have uh, implementing, uh, has been implemented to rate the schools according to their performance. What do you think the impact will be or has been? Thank you. Well, I, d I don't know in detail about that program, but I, um, part of um, any improvement process is to have feedback. So being able to rate the schools, um, I think, is essential. Being able to monitor and rate the um, innovation capability of a region um, is essential. If, if you're not thinking about it systematically, um, it's very easy to do things that are counterproductive. getting the wherewithal to do all of this, the shareholders getting their returns in a fair and just mode. I, I didn't hear the beginning of your question. Shareholders. How do we share all this? You need, you need the wherewithal to do all of these good things. You went out and you acquired capital. The people expect the, expect the return. Right. Were well, they mentioned here? We call them shareholders. We call them shareholders, yes. I'm not, I'm not sure I understood that as a question. We know what's happened in the economy recently yes. and the trust that we put in the entrepreneurs. I could mention companies. Enron, Tyco, Martha Stewart whatever, people in whom we trust and we support with our funds. The procedure of business is to have a return. Right. Not just for the entrepreneur. Right. For the shareholder. I couldn't agree with you more. I, you know, I don't know about you folks, but um, we don't work with unethical people. <laughs> they, they get you in trouble and they fail. And, um, you know, in business, most of us, as soon as you smell something's not quite right, you, you get away from them. So this is all about creating value for shareholders. This is, what's fo this is about focusing on um, um, doing what's right and creating real value. And it's... Um, Stop there. If we could entertain one more question. You mentioned that uh, you work for RCA for years and they give you hundreds of millions of dollars and you failed. <laughs> uh, RCA has sort of gone away. Sort of. And uh, could you comment on the fact that you didn't go away, that somehow you were considered a success and given an even more important position? <laughs> well, I was very fortunate. Um, when RCA went away, we became part of SRI. And I didn't know what SRI was or who it was. And, um, and, um, but it's, it's an organization that um, embodies a lot of the things I just talked about. And so it was very difficult in the beginning because I was a big company sort of person. And I expected to 
if you wanted to do something, somebody had to give you um, tens of millions of dollars. And I discovered through the process I told you about um, that that's really the easy part of the problem. There's plenty of money in the world. And, um, and I had uh, great mentors at SRI, and we learned that what really matters is creating client value for shareholders or for other partners. And if you learn the skills for doing that, you can raise a lot of money. So I went through a tough period, but I was blessed to be part of an organization that embodies these, these ideas. And it's interesting, nothing I did up through my RCA period was successful, and just about everything since becoming part of SRI has been. And it's not, it's not current. It's, it's going back to Deming and the idea of the process you work in, how you work together. It's more important than, than the individual people in the organization. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Carlson. Uh, clearly, uh, oh. uh, thank you for a very interesting talk, very thoughtful talk on uh, global impact and uh, really the opportunities we have in this world today. Thank you, and I have a gift here. Oh, good. Well, thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>